Museo. And guess what? Feliz Años Nuevos. Happy New Year. And giving a Happy New Year to Tim Eagleman, who puts my Coyote Talks up on Tim YouTube. And uh, also for Jim and Kathleen, your red bird and uh, horse with no name man, <laughs> our musician partners, and our San Diego ami amigos, that would be you know, Randy and Mary Devine and Melanie, a.k.a. Nefertiti, and Dick and Richard the sound man, and even down there in Yuma, you know, Wolf and Puma, Aaron and Kathleen, then we go up to Nevada with Vivian Buffalo and Debbie Sutherland Horse. And we want to mention uh, Courtney Stapleton, Peach Girl over in Maui. And then also going over there to Guadalupe, Arizona to our compadres, our compadres, comadre Anita and Junior Alvarez and our godchildren uh, Bernal and Rosie. Um, Dios M. Chinia, and also to Dinata, the Dine, especially the Yazis, and the uh, Hatali who is dreaming me here. Uh, ho Yata Hey! There. <coughs> Let me start right off with, with this piece here. Uh, this is starting out with the first lines in the Nahuatl language. Um, this is a language by uh, Hungry Coyote. He was a poet 500 years ago in Tejicoco in old Mexico. And that's the way I'm going to start. Oh, he, he built a temple for himself and he painted it black inside and out. And said so this is the temple to the Lordess of the Close and Near. Tona Teo, Kuatliki. And the panitro should be in teutal. The sun, eagle, dart of fire, prince of the new year, illuminates, makes things glow, lights them with its rays, is warm, burns people, makes them perspire, turns dark the complexion of people, and she blackens them makes us black as night. Uh oh. Right now we're in the month of January, so just to start off with January in, in the Navajo sense, uh, Navajo are people the Natine, Natinta, in northern Arizona mainly. And uh, Navajo is it's a nice sounding word. It's a kind of a Spanish word for these people, meaning uh, keepers of the great field, so I kind of get along with that also. And so very much that's uh, a lot of the terminology that I'm using here. So for the month of January, Yas uh, meaning this is the month of the crusted snow. So if you can go here to this little display here, that's the way that I'm displaying this here, it's the month of the crusted snow. And also, each month has what they call um, a head feather or a soft feather, which is a constellation. And so, the soft feather for this month is going to be the Morning Star and also the Milky Way. And also, at this time, we find in the eagle nest, there's going to be eagles, the eagle's eggs. And so, we have that here. I have this here for the white eagle. Very very small, right here. So all this is to start out with January, the month of the crusted snow, and the eagle's eggs in the nest, and the morning star. Now we're going to go over here, where we're going to talk about the winter solstice. Um, last week, um, I was up in um, Idlewild, you know, for my birthday, so I'm a December child. And that's going to be really a main part of this theme. December child born for water and winter solstice. So to talk about that at this time, we'll go over here. You can look way over here.
Now this is a picture of a stone. I've replicated this stone, so I'll tell you what it is. <clears throat> it's about that height. It's, it's a, a tall uh, granite, crystalline granite stone. It's located in Nevada overlooking the Truckee River in a section that's called the Court of Antiquity because there are many, many petroglyphs, that's carvings and rocks, in the very large outcropping there. And this stone is directly west of that. And this area is, um, I don't know, a few miles um, east of Reno on the Truckee River. And this stone um, is called the Stone of Baal. <laughs> so now it's inscribed in Celtic. It's a Celtic with Ogham and Ogham and, and Celtic language is what we're, we're looking at here. And on top of the stone, there is a perfect bowl, maybe would hold about, you know, I don't know, a couple gallons of water if you poured it in there. And above the bowl, you know, there's a lip that has an inscription on. I'll tell you what that is. <laughs> and uh, all this would be like a gnome on a sundial, only it's vertical up and down instead of, you know, following, you know, like a clock around like that. In Egypt, it's also called Ben Ben, means Bell Speaks, and the Greeks derived obelisk from it. So you have at the Washington Monument, you have an obelisk. It's the Greek rendering of the Ben Ben, Bell Speaks, and this one here is a Celtic. And the uh, signature on it, you see a, a large X there, in the system of writing in Celtic, it is a, a diphthong or a sliding vowel, or in this sense, it is a divine prefix. And it has been reported in Robert Graves, The White Goddess, that this is a formula, very pervasive in the very ancient Mideast, seemingly starting with Egypt, like that. <clears throat> so that's Ya. You spell it I-A or Y-A. That's Ya. And when you go up to the top, there's a letter there that looks like a C. Very interestingly, this C is from the alphabet in Gaul, which is to say whoever descri uh, inscribed this here is most likely from the Mediterranean or from the country of Gaul rather than from the British Isles, or particularly Ireland, that would be speaking this language. And that uh, C is actually standing for a word. So I have to start with the YA, you go YA, and up to the C, that's HU, H-U, HU. HU is the name of the moon. And there's no way to write that or to inscribe that. So, what the inscriber has done, he has referred to Kalman. Kalman, in Gaelic, is the dove. And the dove is the queen of the moon. So now you've got Yahoo. Now this Yahoo is also figuring in another word most people have become familiar with, glossed as Yahweh or Yahuwah. <laughs> it is actually the same word used in an entirely different way. So, Yahoo! And then we go all the way down to that X again. So, right to the right of it, you see these little lines. And these little lines are written in the Ogham, spelling Bell. B-L. Bell. Now, Bell is like the sunlight coming from the sun. And the sun is the mother of Bell in Gaelic. Graham. So, this inscription reads very simply and concisely, Yahoo Bell. Now what we have is that we're arriving at the winter solstice and we're looking at this stone from uh, the June, which was the summer solstice. It gradually got darker. In other words, a shadow is coming up and, and from the bottom until the, sun is the stone is totally in the dark. Um, so, when we arrive at the winter solstice, we're looking at a darkened stone. And now what happens, mythically, is the winter eagle. The winter eagle comes up from Shinar, 
that's the ancient land below, and comes up and alights on top of the stone, crowning the stone with the light. And so here, this is a Navajo style of that eagle that I have here for the thunder eagle, uh, winter eagle. And so from the days from winter solstice, now as the sun is you know, moving northward, the light that's coming down over the stone, over the stone, over the stone, over the stone, until it's completely in the light come the summer solstice, and this would be rendered as the glory of Bell. So that's what we have here. Now, what is the meaning of this, you know, the moon? The moon governs the solar year in the ancient times before they changed all these. So that's what it is, so that this would, this X would say, Yahoo, meaning exalted, the moon, and so forth. And all, all of this is now what I've described to you is rendered in the Celtic and in the Gaelic and in the Ogham way of writing. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of transpose this, translate this into Navajo. Now, the people were calling Navajo or the Diné, they're very eclectic. Um, their relatives and ancestors uh, evidently are, and their language shows, they're from western Turkestan, way over there on the other side. And um, I kind of localized them in Khotan. Khotan is on the east side of the Tarim Basin. And they have some uh, relatives that the Americans call Apaches who are from the west side of that Tarim Basin, and their language is very similar, very close. So that's what I have changed it here because the Navajos somehow, in their collectiveness, have brought this stone into their culture. So that's what I'm doing here with this. <clears throat> so now in this culture, I'm going to give you a different kind of rendering here. So when I go up here, and this is the moon, I'm taking you up here to this. This is a Navajo sand painting, we'll call that. And instead of the dove for Kalman in the Gaelic, here I have the falcon moon. This is a falcon moon because now I'm rendering this in the Navajo perspective. So that's what we're having here. And the character that's going to be born out of this is in Navajo, Tomas Shishini. Uh, he's called Born for Water, but his name actually means he whom she bore for water. Born for water is kind of like saying, my mother's clan. And so that's pretty much how he's referred to. He also has many other names, you know, changing grandchild, holy boy, uh, water, water child, uh, uh, younger brother. Uh, all, of, all of these names are variously used in the myth and chant ways here of all this. So all of this is what we're having going on here. And down here, I have done a drawing, a replica from an early sand painting that would depict him, born for water. Now, on his red body, there are these X's. And so, how the Navajo have taken this over into their culture, this symbol, which in Gaelic, you know, means Yah, they have rendered it as the signature for Holy Boy, as the, uh, I'm going to call it, it's a hair tie, it's a hair tie, sis diddle oodle, that the woman ties like a bun in her hair. And so this gives him the signature, he's very female-like, he's very attached, he's, he's his mother's son, very much so. <clears throat> and the other thing we have here, these, this is the water bearer, he's carrying little pots for water. 
and this is like an oversized uh, um, beaver. He's really a kind of a monster that lives in the water. And this is the black star. All of which I'm going to be following this with is going to be a rendering of the um, black star chant or the great star chant. <laughs> and this star is up in the sky as the black star and it gives a seed of her son into this pool of water on this rock. This rock in the Navajo, if you go over here, this is the sky reaching rock. This rock in Navajo is now called the sky reaching rock. And the Hatali in the ceremony with the sand painting makes a clay replica just like this that's on the sand painting. And I put these lines up here to say it's reaching for the sky. The sky reaching for the, the rocks reaching for the sky. So now what's happening here, I'm just going to tell you, I render this here as like a waterfall. Is that this uh, bowl of water overflows and like a waterfall flows down and flows down and flows down like this into a pool of water. And now Coyote, like the midwife, he wades into the pool of water and picks him up. Picks him up and he lifts, he lifts him up to the sky. He has been born from the star up in the sky into the pool of water and down the waterfall into this pool of water and Coyote has you know, raised him up as being born. So that's the way that it, it has taken place. So let me, let me uh, read to you so I get all my notes straight here. Child born of water, holy boy, is one of the faces of her female substance, her blackness wet body her epiphany of her revealing nature. Her first child bears a quality that is not meant to grow, but to remain as it is, as a child. At the threshold intact, the personal image of our living world needs this original child, which can only be presented in this way. Holy Boy speaks of his own childhood and of everything of that first sun rising. Holy Boy is the wonder of all beginnings and the wonder of beginning again. It is Holy Boy who leads us to imagine being in the world as in the first day of creation to see anew for the first time. Little heart, little heart, you have snug into me a spiral. You give birth to this mother's bud. Uh -huh. and when we now can come over here and look look at this, this piece here I have painted. Um, earlier I had made several of these head masks of Navajo in natural materials, you know, like you know leather and horse hair and. And, and feathers and like that. And I, I had a show of these in Nevada at a library and uh, according to the people who took care of that said over 300 people signed the register to see this show of these. Uh, and th those paintings are still in Nevada. Uh, here I've now done a painting of this. This is the uh, head mask, meaning it, it fits over a person's head who impersonates, that's why we would call it, you know, in the ceremony. So, with this red here and then the hair, originally used uh, like a Spanish moss, but now they use uh, like a horse hair. I like that. And so here in the face, this is, you know, meant to be his mother, you know, the blackness. 
and over his eyes are tiny Olivia shells. Somehow these Olivia shells are anciently significant because even in the 10,000 year old cave in Nevada they have found a staff made you know, with the Olivia shells. So maybe it's to say something of the water. So that's what's going on there. And then here is, is this symbol of again that is the mother or woman's hair tie. And that becomes his main symbol. And then these these straight marks here are rain. It you know, stands for rain. And then of course the coyote fur, which I have encircled here, and the coyote uh, staff up here. And when you go up here, this is black star. Black star Tsotsu is also great, great star. And the, the simple verse that goes with this, the black spaces as much star as star. So he is then the son of black star from which all this is coming, coming from. And over here, this is another sand painting, and this would be Hashish Jasini, rendered in English as Black God. And so that gives me to make a comment. Uh, these English words, God, supernatural, deities, holy people, these are English words that are coming from European people of the 19th century who are so totally saturated in the concepts of the West or, or Europe. And these are not what these things mean because if you start putting that these people are venerating or worshiping or playing with gods and supernaturals, you have a whole uh, offense factor for Europeans and that is what, what has happened. Um, the, the word in Navajo, ye, is similar to the Gaelic jia. And these are not gods, these are not supernaturals, these are not holy people, in the English way of saying those things. <clears throat> the most comparable to the ye are the she of the Irish. The she are like the ye, they are in rocks and caves and things like that. They're there. They're invisible. They're not visible at all. <clears throat> the portrayal of them in ceremony, in terms of masks and sand paintings, is to make palpable these energies or these forces, which <laughs> I'm trying by this ritualistic way are to encounter these energies and forces in a way that they might respond to us. But uh, all of this is about healing. If people have some kind of a disorder, somebody has diagnosed the disorder uh, and have recommended what saying, what chant, what circumstance, you know, uh, the patient should apply to, to a Hatali, to somebody who is specialized in this. The Hatali is like a medicine man and not a shaman because there is something that's like a systematic, that is something you have, you have to go to college and study and you know and you have to uh, perform it just right and so forth. So the Hatali is, means the chanter and he is the one who, they have hundreds of them to, to go together with the right symptom. So we have all of that. But none of these things, not the chants and not the impersonators and not the sand paintings are doing the patient. All of this is to make the patient susceptible to taking care of himself or herself to restore the balance. And these are all aids for that kind of restoration. So to understand these are not supernaturals or gods that can act upon somebody. So you really want to get that across because it's just really uh, caused a lot of misunderstanding. So back you know, to this, this is a rendering of blackness is her body is the way that I render it. And this is a sand painting and the Milky Way is this a zigzag you know, through her. 
And if you can go over here and you get a close-up of this, this is another little Sam painting I regard as sacred. And it's a, uh, in a sense, a female, yay. And what she's holding in her hand, I know it's very tiny, is the frond of life. The Irish, ancient Irish, you know, also have the same thing, interestingly. So the frond of life is cho. Cho is a spruce. It means spruce. And that's because changing woman, she manifested or was born on Spruce Hill. It's just over there on the west side of New Mexico. And the name Cho'o Da'a is saying, in the beginning. So it's very significant that she is holding this frond of life, and in her other hand she is holding a rattle, you would say a seed, rattle. So all of this, you know, again, is all to go with all this kind of restoration here. And then if I come down to this, because the piece I'm going to read to you is going to have white snake in it and White Snake Hogan. So that's why I have this here. And then over here, this is the rock crystal you saw before because that figures in a piece I'm going to read to you. And here is Black Body <clears throat> and a star. And here is an, another piece of White Snake. And this picture here, this is from Edward Curtis, this titled, you know, Young um, Navajo lad. And so it's very interesting to look that he's wearing this headband. And this is another thing that the people who are calling Navajo and the people who the Americans are calling Apaches uh, are more characteristic of wearing this headband. This headband is C, uh, C, not C, A, you know. And these people have come from that part of the world where we would say turban. Tuban is the Turkish word uh, for this headpiece, like that. And, and that's what I'm showing here with this uh, young lad, very characteristic, you know, whenever Curtis took this picture, certainly some years ago. So that to me is significant to see that. And this here, if you can go up to this piece here, uh, these are called talking prayer sticks. I have these from the Hatali and uh, they're made of argonite and it's a kind of male and female talking prayer sticks which you will hear in the piece I'm going to read and these cotton balls are offerings that's what they mean there to make these uh, as offerings and we go all the way down here this is a Navajo basket and this basket has been covered with pine pitch and this one is made by Etta Rick, uh, I think from around <coughs> Tuba City. And I have it on a sand painting as well. Now I have it here for water, to like stand for water. In other words, the Navajo and the Apaches, also the Paiutes, made these kind of baskets, woven baskets, covering them with pine pitch to carry water in. So I have it here as a symbol for water in all of that. And again, this sky-reaching rock and these prongs that I have to go up here, in order to bring into focus that part of this chant or myth, you know, is the realization of sky powers. Now the process through ceremony, ritual, is to bring the sky powers to earth and to earth where they can order our lives. Um, Cherokee, I come from the Cherokee. The Cherokee is that we come from the stars. Basically the Pleiades. <laughs> and uh, many other people, First Nations, also see ourselves as coming from the stars. So in this whole rendering here, um, Born for Water, is the son of Black Star. <laughs> and the knowledge that he, in this whole myth ceremony process, is bringing knowledge to humans, you know, to, to the earth. <clears throat> so that's what's going on that matters very much. And so, um, with that, this piece I'm going to read to you is from the uh, Great Star Chant. 
and the, the great star chant, you know, is the black star. It's called Sotsu, big star, great star. <clears throat> the great star chant. From the center of the sky, born for water, using his blue staff, comes in to search for me. With lightning flashing before him, lightning flashing behind him, he comes in to search for me. Using his rock crystal and prayer stick, he comes in to search for me. At the emergence place, he comes in to search for me. Behind the great snake, where my feet lie, where my body lies, where my mind lies, where my voice lies, where my power of movement lies, I came in searching for all of these. Farther on, he comes in to search for me, behind the great white snake. As the rainbow returns with me, and the prayer sticks teach me, he returns with me. From the white snake, Hogan, kind feelings will come to you as you go about in life, my grandchild, he says to me as he sits down beside me. Guided by these things, you shall live on, respected everywhere, my grandchild. Guided by these things, you shall find protection in all places as you live on, my grandchild. He says to me, as he sits down beside me, this enables you to live on in blessing. Blessed again, it has become. Uh -oh. These are the, the prayer sticks that teach the talking prayer sticks. So that is, you know, a rendering, I've shortened it, of the whole great star chant and what the meaning is of that. And all of this I am bringing forth because it is the winter solstice, because it is the new year. But also, we are in an exact time that I am doing everything as a coyote to uh, take advantage of this. I would call it, we are in a trough between two waves and that that's going to move. And so all this is to bring about a transformation and a, a rendering that's going to be very positive. We want, want to have all of that so that you can know why I have brought all of these uh, fertile and potent things together here in my, my layout, my mesa. Uh, these things are all real and I'm fortunate to have learned them. And I'm going to finish now with a poem from Mary Oliver that I find that is very suitable. She titles this, this is from Devotions, uh, Black Snakes. Suddenly, there I was on the warm rocks, fear like a mallet slung against metal. It was that sudden, not loud, though in truth there was no sound, only the rough wing of fright rushing through our bodies. One flowed under the leaves, the other flared half in length into the air against my body, then swirled away. Once I had steadied, I thought, how valiant! And I wished I had come softly. I wished they were my dark friends. For a moment I stared through the impossible gates. Then I saw them, under the vines, coiled, cringing, wish me gone with their stone eyes. Not knowing what I would do next, their tongues shook like fire at the echoes of my body, that column of death plunging through 
the delicate woods. Mm -hmm. 